Hi, I'm Jennifer Williams, Head of Early Childhood here at Sycamore, and I'm really excited to be able to share some book ideas with you today um, that are especially targeted towards young gifted learners. So here's, here's what I'd like to start with, some classic fairy tales and folk tales. The first is Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and this version is retold by one of my favorite authors and illustrators, Jan Brett. So here's what I'd like for you to notice about this classic version. First of all, when you look inside Jan Brett's books, what you'll find is a lot of detail in her illustrations. For example, when you take a look here at the bear's house, you and your child can sit down and just take several minutes and talk about the pictures together. The bear's door has um, intricate carvings of bears doing different activities on it. You'll see um, up at the top where there are um, honey hives, beehives decorating the roof of the um, house. You'll notice some interesting rooftops and uh, Jan Brett always tries to research her settings. And so for this one, she's channeled a lot of Scandinavian combined with Bavarian um, influences. So you can talk about that with your child. It's also great to pay attention to what's happening in the borders of all of her books. So you'll see here, there's a pair of field mice down here and they start to pop up on a lot of the pictures and so as you go through this um, three bears tale you'll find the mice popping up and it's almost a secondary story weaved in here so this version is again pretty close to the classic uh, fairy tale they start off in the woods Goldilocks comes through um, you'll see here this is a good example of why you should pay attention to the borders of her books. You've got the bears coming back and discovering that someone has been tasting their porridge. But over here, what's happening is Goldilocks is upstairs asleep in the beds. And then again, you'll find what's happening with the mice. So this is a super classic version to start with. Then what I recommend is you take some other versions of Goldilocks and the Three Bears and pair those together. So another favorite of mine is the version by James Marshall, and he is a Caldecott Honor Book um, Award winner. And you'll find that James Marshall does a lot of takeoffs. He has a Red Riding Hood version, Hansel and Gretel version. So this happens to be his Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And you'll see the pictures in this book contrast very nicely to the original with Jan Bretz. This is a much more um, stylized cartoon version, a little bit more modern. Um, you've got the bears in the forest with the sunflowers. And again, you could do a lot of great comparing and contrasting with your child. Pull up Jan's, Jan Brett's version of the house and uh, James Marshall's version and talk about that. His um, text is also a little bit more modern. Um, for example, um, you know, on the next page, when um, they're sitting down with their porridge before they go out, you know, the um, Papa Bear cries, Patui, this porridge is scalding. I've burned my tongue. I'm dying, cried Baby Bear. Now really, said Mama Bear. So even the language is a little bit different. You can do a lot of comparing and contrasting there. And then if you look, I wanted to show you, for example, here's another picture of Baby Bear's room. And again, it's a big contrast. It's a very modern room and crowded, but the essence of the story stays about the same. So you still have the general plot. Um, you've got some language differences and some illustration differences. So then I've got two more versions that are very intriguing. The next one that I would put with this group is called Goldie and the Three hairs and this is by Margie Palatini and illustrated by Jack Davis. I told you at the beginning that Jan Brett was one of my favorites. Um, 
hers I love because of the intricacies of her illustrations. But let me tell you, Margie Palatini is uh, right up there with her. Margie writes with a lot of humor and a lot of um, uh, connections to other fairy tales. And so you've, you've really, you're gonna love her. This is only one, or one of her books and it is hilarious. Goldie and the Three Hairs. So it starts off, this is a, a family of rabbits and of course they live down in a hole and what happens is one day um, Goldilocks comes by and she trips and gets her foot caught in their hole and she falls down and she's got a swollen foot and she can't get back up. So get me out of here is what she cries. What was that, said Papa and Mama. Quick to the door, ran Bunny. It's a foot, he cried, peeking through the tiny window. A big foot that belongs to a big little girl who fell down our rabbit hole and landed splat on the door stoop. And she can't get out. And so the problem is the hares are trying to get Goldilocks back out. So the story continues on and they try all sorts of things to figure out how to get her back out of that rabbit hole. Finally, they come up with a solution, and I don't want to spoil the whole end, but at one point, Bunny says, I've had it. I'm calling the bears. The bears? Uh-oh, gotta go. Goodbye. So long. See ya. Arriva Derchi, rabbits. And the big little girl with the big swollen foot scooted out of the hare house without even an achoo and ran up the rabbit hole past that Lulu of a first step and the three hares went back to enjoying a quiet peaceful lovely day until thump bump kaboom pardon me I say has anyone seen a white rabbit lately and who enters the picture but Alice in Wonderland falling down the rabbit hole. So that's a great story. And then a second follow-up is by another great author and illustrator, Lisa Campbell Ernst. So she takes the character of Goldilocks and turns it into Goldilocks Returns. And the story opens with a quick reminder of, yes, this was Goldilocks back when she was a young girl and a reminder of what happened and that now as an adult she really is regretting those actions and her decisions. And so as an older woman we discover that Goldilocks has opened her own lock and key store to provide security for families. However it says her customers even began to look like bears. I can't take it any longer, she cried. It's time that I set things right. So early one morning, Goldie loaded up her truck, turned her shop sign to closed, and zoomed off towards the deep dark woods. So she's heading off now as an adult to make things better with the bears. And then we catch up with the bears all of these years later, who are a bit older, and Baby Bear is no longer so teeny and tiny. What Goldilocks does is goes to their house while they're out, yes, yet again, and installs locks and security systems. She changes out their porridge for healthy, tart and tasty celery juice, and she fancies up all of their beds and the bedrooms and puts all of their chairs back together, thinking that she knows best and she's trying to help them out. When they come home to find the grown-up Goldilocks with them, they, sh they shout, Now don't thank me. I know you're terribly grateful. But after all, I was the one who caused all that trouble to begin with. And of course, I've made up for that. Naturally, I fixed your silly little chair and I got rid of that nasty porridge. The rutabaga breakfast bars are fat-free, so you might even be able to lose that extra weight there. She chuckled, tapping Papa Bear on the stomach. Well, needless to say, the bears are not happy with all of these fixes. They eventually wave goodbye to Goldilocks and wonder what in the world are they going to do in their fixed up house. Fortunately, along comes
another little girl. They leave the house and this time they agree that it's a good thing they left it unlocked. Maybe she will put their house back the way they want it again. So that is a great set of four books to go along with Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Another one I want to show you is a grouping of two books about the Three Billy Goats Gruff. So the first one is again more the classic version. It's by Jer Jerry Pickney. Um, he is a Caldecott Award winner. His illustrations, illustrations are beautiful. You might know his book um, with the lion and the mouse. That is a beautiful one. So now if you get this version at home, the first thing I want you to do is open it up and look at the end pages. Mine is covered up a bit here because it's the library version, but what you really need to do is get the whole thing and spread it out and just spend some time talking with your child about what's happening in this end page. This is a beautiful way to really start um, the story off and set the scene for what's going on. And you've got the troll over here and the billy goats here. And you'll see why when we get to the end. This is so important to start here. So this version is pretty classic until we get to the end. You'll see some really great illustrations um, with the goats going across the bridge, the troll hearing them, stopping them. They convince him to let them go until they can eat and get fatter. But at the end, Jerry Pickney introduces a brand new character, this fish. So at the end, when the um, billy goats push the troll over into the water, all of a sudden we see the appearance of this fish. It's only I, the troll squeaks. I'm going to gobble you up now says the fish. Jerry Pickney wanted the troll to kind of get a taste of his own medicine and find out what it was like to have somebody else try to control him. So luckily the troll then gets himself out of the water and over to the side where he has to watch in defeat as herds of billy goats join their friends on the other hillside. And so you think that this is the end of the story, but not really, because you turn to the very end and take a look again at what is now happening in these end pages. And that's left up to your interpretation. So I'm not gonna spoil that end, but there's a lot to discuss about this and about um, making amends and do you think the troll learned his lesson and what kind of lesson do you think the billy goats learned, etc. So this is a really great version. Then we had come back to Margie Palatini again. So she paired up with a different illustrator this time, Barry Moser, and she wrote the three silly billies. And as you start this version, again, you're going to look for a lot of humor, a lot of wordplay in her books, and in hers, the three silly billies were ready to kick up their heels and have some fun in the sun. They packed up their old jalopy and with a spit, a chug, and a honk, off they tootled. Down the hill and through the woods went the billies until they came to a small wooden bridge that crossed a very deep river. So they headed toward this bridge. They're off for some fun. And who do they find but the troll? Because this is not a toll bridge, it's a troll bridge. And he, this grumpy little stumpy man, was blocking their path. And he said, hold your horsepower, the little man said with a stamp, a stomp and a snort. This is a troll bridge, and I'm the troll. Now start passing the buck. So you see a lot of phrases you can talk about with your child. What does it mean to pass the buck? Have they ever been across um, a toll bridge or a toll road where you had to pay the fee? So he collects, is trying to collect the, the fee for going across, but the billy goats are out of money. So they have to just sit and wait until along come the three bears who also don't have enough money to cross the bridge. So the billy goats invite them to wait and maybe they can put their resources together. 
They still don't have enough to get across. So guess who comes next? Little Red Riding Hood. And she says, oh my goodness. And she searches her basket. And does, does she have enough money to cross? Not yet. And then who comes along but Jack from Jack and the Beanstalk. He's got his magic beans, but no money. And eventually they do all put their money together and get themselves across the bridge. However, that's not the end of the troll. Following Jack comes somebody large and green. Fee, fi, fo, fum. Is that a troll I smell? Yum, yum, yum. And then the ending comes after that. Now, in our next section, I'd like to give a shout out to books that reflect songs. So common um, songs that you might sing with your child or they might hear in music class. And my favorite author for these kinds of books is Isa Trapani. So you'll see um, she has taken, for example, Old MacDonald Had a Farm and changed it to Old MacDonald Had a Zoo. And when you start the book out, it's pretty traditional. Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, and you can go on through. It's your typical song until all of a sudden, Old MacDonald in the sty, E-I-E-I-O, saw a kangaroo hop on by, E-I-E-I-O, and so all of a sudden you're not expecting a kangaroo on the farm and this is where Isa changes the song lyrics and she adds all of these exotic or more like zoo animals and what happens with the kangaroo old mcdonald heard a plunk e-i-e-i-o an elephant had come to dunk E-I-E-I-O, and then again, it goes through. And so you can read the story with your child or you can sing it with them. Pretty soon they'll pick up on the pattern, but it's really great to kind of combine that with a change. And as she goes through, eventually we get crocodiles and we get zebras and we have monkeys. And finally, Old MacDonald cries no more. He stomped his foot hard on the floor with a stomp stomp left and a stomp stomp right here a stomp there a stomp everywhere a stomp stomp now he had just one more chore e-i-e-i-o and you can talk about oh where do you think's happening and stop and make some predictions and what does he do but he loads them up into his trailer and they are headed back to the zoo so this is a fun one and another great one. I won't go all the way through, but it's Itsy Bitsy Spider. Again, lots of different versions. Um, so look for Isa Trapani. She's a great one. Now I'd like to show you a few books that kind of focus on some social emotional issues and have some multi multicultural themes as well. This is a really sweet book called The Rabbit Listened by Corey Dorfield. And the book starts out when we meet this little character named Taylor. And what I want you to notice at first is Taylor is always referred to as Taylor. They never use a pronoun. So Taylor could be a boy and Taylor could be a girl. So you can interpret it with your child as you see fit and you could talk about different things. Um, but Taylor starts off by wanting to build something amazing, something new and something special. And so Taylor works really hard and was really proud of this creation. And then all of a sudden, something out of Taylor's control out of nowhere takes it down and now how does Taylor react what are the emotions and this is the part where you go through um, things come crashing down and the chicken was the first to notice and all of these animals start to notice and they come into the picture and they try to talk to Taylor and they try to tell Taylor how how Taylor should be reacting to this coming the creation falling down one by one they came the hyena says he he let's laugh about it the ostrich gulp 
let's hide and pretend nothing happened. The kangaroo says, tisk tisk, what a mess. Let's just throw it all away. And the snake, shh, let's go knock down someone else's. So again, all of these typical reactions that young children can have when something doesn't go their way, whether it's a, you know, a building creation that falls down, etc., goes through a lot of other reactions until the rabbit comes. And then the rabbit comes and just sits next to Taylor. And then the rabbit listened. And the rabbit listened as Taylor talked. The rabbit listened as Taylor shouted as Taylor remembered and laughed. The rabbit listened to Taylor's plans to hide, to throw everything away, to ruin things for someone else. And eventually, through it all, the rabbit never left. And when the time was right, the rabbit listened to Taylor's plan to build again. I can't wait, Taylor said. So again, it's a great, example of working through your feelings and all those feelings that young people have when things do not go as planned. The next one is a, is a collection or actually a very long poem book called A Girl Like Me by Angela Johnson and it's illustrated by Nina Cruz. She does a great job with collages of photography and this book is about some young girls and I'll only share part of it with you here. This little girl says, I used to dream I walked over tall buildings in flowing scarves and a cowgirl hat. Never was scared or paid attention when people I knew said, a girl like you needs to stop walking over those tall buildings in funny clothes and get down here with the rest of us. So a little hint of be yourself, be who you are, and then at the end, the girls get together and they go to the beach, to the ocean, to the beach. And it ends with a great phrase. Because a girl like me should always be thinking way up high. And it shows girls from different walks of life and how they always should be talking and thinking about the things they can achieve and how they can be themselves and reach for those high goals. So this is a great one, A Girl Like Me. This one is a collection of different individual poems. It's called Lend a Hand by John Frank. Its illustrations are by Landon Ladd. And each page shows a different young person doing acts of selflessness or doing something to help the community around them. So this page is talking about the puppy that they're raising and that this child's family is raising a service dog. And it talks about how they'll have to give the service dog away because he'll be someone's eyes one day. This page talks about, um, it took six years to grow my hair this long. And it's a girl who is growing her hair for the locks of love. And again, it's just a simple poem talking about this character, but again, doing something for someone else. This poem right here talks about no charge and helping somebody just to be kind and just to help and how to pass that along. And so this young man has helped this mother put her groceries in the car. And again, when she goes to tip him, he says, no charge. It's just my way of helping. And this page is reflected on the cover of the book as well, but it's about a bus ride. And on a downtown bus, I had my earphones on, filling my head with some hard beat sounds as the street sped by, until a man gets on the bus and this young man pays attention and realizes he needs a place to sit. And so he gets up and gives his seat to someone else who needs it more. So this is a great book. Again, it's all young people doing selfless acts. 
and um, showing how to give back and it makes kids know, or makes kids realize that they can give back and they can make a difference and do things to help their community. This last book is something I'd like to share with you. It's called Intersection Allies. We make room for all. And this was written by three graduate students, uh, Chelsea Johnson, Latoya Council, and Carolyn Choi. Um, and it is a book I would recommend for kindergarten students or older. I don't think it's um, as applicable to younger students. I think some of the concepts in here are a little bit more difficult to understand. But it introduces you to a group of friends that come originally from all over the world and all and have um, all sorts of different um, experiences in their home life and how they help each other out and how they support each other. So then in the back of the book it gives um, a lot of great book notes and let's learn together in a page-by-page -page book discussion guide for parents. And again, some of these issues are a little bit tougher than others to talk about with your child. Um, we're talking about community care and collective parenting, making things accessible, um, talking about gender, um, about religious um, traditions, and maybe different things like a hijab that uh, students might wear or they might find other people wearing. It's talking about the Native American protests of the pipelines out in the Dakotas. Um, so again, some little, a little bit more complicated issues that I think kindergarten kids or older might be able to ta be able to tackle with a parent. But it's got great notes in the back to support you as a parent and know what is um, being shown in those pictures. So this is a great resource too. Thanks again for hanging out with me for a bit and talking about children's books. I want to give a shout out to Shirley Mullins over at Kids Inc. If you are looking to get some great book, book recommendations here in town, I suggest you go there. Kids Inc. is just down the street at 56th and Illinois and it's a great place um, to support a local bookstore and get great ideas for books. Thanks! Hi, I'm Glenna Likens. I'm the head of Lower School, and I'm excited to be talking to parents about best books for gifted kids. We've done this a few times at Sycamore, and I'm very happy to be doing this this year, uh, my last year working at Sycamore. Um, I have a list of books, and I've actually sent this list to all of you, and I've highlighted on that list some of the books I'm going to talk about today. This entire list you can also find though on the portal and the library page. So if you go to the portal to the classes on your students page and click library and then click topics, you can find this whole list and it even hyperlinks the ones that are at our library. So if you have some that you think would be great to buy, that's wonderful. If you have some you think someday you'd want your child to check out, you have that option too. So the list is arranged by category and I'm going to start with some biographies. So um, from the biographies I've listed, <clears throat> I first want to talk about Gwendolyn Brooks. The book is called Exquisite, and it's a biography on Gwendolyn Brooks. She was uh, the 1950 Pulitzer Prize winner for poetry, and that was um, quite an achievement in those days for an African-American woman. And uh, this is her biography. And one of the books that I think would be a really great pairing with this is from the, the section that I've got listed for poetry. She did write a book of poems for young students called Bronzeville. So these two could be a wonderful pairing. Great to read about her life. Um, lots of exciting, um, just inspiring things to read about her. And then the books, <coughs> the book of poems, and the illustrations are pretty amazing too and I think the kids would enjoy pairing those together. So the next story I'd like to share is uh, it's called Greta's Story and it's a story about Greta Thunberg. She's from Sweden and in the years 2018 and 19, so just a couple years ago, she became concerned about global warming in the planet and things that were happening in Sweden she became so concerned and worried and wanted people to step up and do something to help 
the earth that she went on strike from school and from that it grew into probably a lot more than she expected until there became a global Fridays for the future and she ended up going to the UN summit on climate change. So this is a great book no matter what your thoughts on global warming might be. It's a great book for a student to hear about what they as a kid can do with something that's really important to them. So another highly recommended book by me. Another one then is called Imagine and this is written by Juan Felipe Herrera who was the U.S. Poet Laureate from 2015 to 17. And the reason I love this book along with the illustrations, it um, talks about what a student or a child can do if they just imagine. So it tells about his life and he didn't have an easy life and yet he grew up to do what he loved, writing poetry and became the U.S. Poet Laureate. And every page is just trying to get kids to imagine what can happen when something is important for them. So that's another one I recommend. And then the last in that section of biographies I recommend, I had never heard of Anna Atkins. If you have scientists out there in your life, I think they'll be really amazed by this book. It's called The Bluest of Blues. And Anna Atkins was one of the first women photographers in 1841. And in 1843, she actually created a book. So originally she was working with cameras, but then there was a way to take chemicals and sunlight and to lay, um, uh, lay objects down on it and then it would create these uh, blue photographs that stayed. They didn't um, fade away over time. So I think kids would really enjoy looking through this book, reading about her life, and then toward the end it talks about what kids could do if they wanted to create some pictures like this too. And it actually goes through the steps you can do to get the chemicals, which would need a lot of parent help with that, and create your own um, photographs that look much like hers. So this is another one that I would highly recommend. So that is from the section, the first section called Biographies. And then the next section um, concerns nonfiction books. And I know that a lot of our lower school students are really nonfiction fans, so am I. So the first two I want to talk about um, are these really cool photographs that are taken from above the earth looking down. And this book overview I've actually shared with uh, many of the third and fourth grade students. They've, I've had them look through some of these pages and see it. And this is, it's just so cool. <laughs> uh, the author, Benjamin Grant, actually has a website and so it's over-view.com and he has some of these photographs there. I'm going to just show you a couple that I shared with the kids. For example, this was one and I asked students looking down on it what they thought this was and where it was. Not sure if you can tell either. This is actually looking down on the Florida Everglades. So you're looking at the green mango trees and then because of the sediment that washes into the waterways it turns them colors. So every page is full of all of these really cool, cool pictures. Another one I shared with some of the kids, they have some before and after pictures where they're looking down on the same spot. And this is a place in South Africa before and after a drought. So again, this book is just full of amazing photographs of what the earth looks like in all kinds of different places looking down on it. So I highly, highly recommend this one. And the kids that, that looked at some of the pictures with me loved it. And then kind of then to go along with that, there's another one that's called The Alphabet from the Sky. Same idea, looking down on some place in, I think most of these are in the USA. And looking down and then you try to find the letter. So on these pages it says find the T and after you look a while you'll see the letter T. The other neat thing about this book is that it gives the coordinates so if you have Google Maps then you can find it yourself and your kids can kind of zoom in and look at it. So knowing our uh, Sycamore students both of these would be really highly um, excited. They would make the kids really excited. Another one, a lot of our kids love animals and I had never heard the story of Springer. 
So this is called The Spirit of Springer, and it's the real-life story of an orca whale who had gotten lost from her pod of whales, and the true story of how uh, different scientists tried to help her find her way home. So the whole book talks about it. She was reunited with her pod, and then at the back it's really cool because it talks about how they can decide and decipher what pod a certain orca whale might be from, and they talk about different orca facts. One of the facts I learned when I read this book was that an orca is not really in the whale family, it's a kind of a dolphin. So uh, lots of interesting facts about this and then a heartwarming story about how she got back together with the pod that she had gotten lost from. So I know kids would really enjoy this book too. And then the last one that I'll share from the nonfiction, um, some of your kids may have read some of these. It's called um, Science and this one is on trees, but there are different topics and different uh, ones you can get. They're graphic novels, so a lot of kids love that, but actually novel isn't the right word because these are nonfiction, and the whole thing is full of cool facts about trees. So I know our second graders study trees. It might be a good one for second grade, but for anybody that has any interest at all in facts about real things, this series is a good one to get to know too, so look for that one. And then uh, the next section is on graphic novels, and I have just one to share with you. So a lot of our kids find graphic novels. I don't think we need to steer them a lot. But this one was really interesting. So if any of your kids ever read The Invention of Hugo Cabre by Brian Selznick or any of those, this is very similar to that. It's a mystery. A little bit spooky, I thought, at times, but there are um, whole sections of just pictures to read through, and then it would be followed by a little bit of um, writing that, that lets you finish and continue along with the story, and then a whole other section of just the pictures. So kids can alternate between reading a little bit to get caught up on the storyline and then looking at the pictures and following along. Really cool. I think kids would really enjoy it. It's called Thornhill, and it's under the graphic novel section. Okay, we're moving on to fiction stories now, and um, a lot of our students do love fiction stories from every age. So I am going to be highlighting three authors in this section, and you can see their books on the list that I have sent out. The first one I want to talk about is Catherine Applegate, and in the past I have actually talked about the one and only Ivan, and the reason I'm showing that again twofold, if you have kids, uh, some of the younger kids that have never ever read this, I highly, highly recommend it. It's one of my favorite books of all time. And it's, a, it's based on a true story of a gorilla that was taken away from its home, brought over to America because poachers had taken it and sold it to somebody in America. And Ivan had spent years of his life in um, a shopping mall and then was finally rescued when people started to protest, protest the way he was being treated. And he was then moved to a zoo in Atlanta where he could spend out the rest of his years. This is a fiction story, though, where the animals talk. There were other animals there, too, and he made friends with them. I highly recommend this, if you get it, to pair it with the picture book that Catherine Applegate also did. And in this picture book about Ivan, unlike the, the novel, which is a, a fictionalized um, make of it, this is the real true story of Ivan, and it tells in picture book form all about his life. And what's really cool with this that kids love, in the back, when she talks about Ivan, you can actually see some pictures of the real Ivan, which the kids love to do. And you can go to the website at, at the Atlanta Zoo's, it's called Zoo Atlanta, and see more pictures about Ivan and hear about his life. He lived a long life. He did die in 2012, but kids love this story. And it's actually been turned into a movie, so that might be something else you want to do over winter break, is read the books and find the movie. The reason I'm bringing them back is because there's now a sequel in our library. The book copy is out right now, so here's the picture of it, the one and only Bob. So Bob in the novel is one of 
um, Ivan's friends. It's a little dog. And so this one then takes the story of Bob the dog and continues on the adventure. So if you've read The One and Only Ivan and your kids loved it, go for The One and Only Bob. And if you haven't read Ivan yet, get them both. I would highly recommend that. So those are Catherine Applegate books. And then I wanted to highlight Sarah Pennypacker. Um, many of you probably have had your kids read either the Clementine books or the Whalen books. These are both series, and they're really great for even more of your beginning readers, first and second grade. They're um, shorter uh, novels that they can really get into, and because they're a series, they'll love them. But Sarah Pennypacker also writes books for older students. As a matter of fact, if your child is a fourth grader in Mrs. Wright's homeroom, before we went into distance learning, I was going in and doing some book talks with them. They were listening to the podcast of one of Sarah Pennypacker's books called Pax, which is an amazing story. And we're going to try to keep that up during distance learning, too. But two other um, novels by her are Here in the Real World and Summer of the Gypsy Moths. So if your student is in Mrs. Wright's homeroom and they love packs, you might try one of these for them or for the older kids. And if they haven't read or heard of packs, that's another one that you can add to it also. So Sari P Sarah Pennypacker is one that I've highlighted, and I think you can't go wrong with some of her novels, too. And then the last uh, author I'd like to highlight that I've got some books listed is um, Blue Balliette, if I'm saying her name correctly. So for the students that love mysteries, these are all great. I really highly recommend them. Chasing Vermeer is an art mystery, um, and I might have talked about this one other time. This was, one, I think, her very first book out. But uh, kids that have read it love it. So if you uh, want to try some of hers, she's also done Out of the Wild Night and The Danger Box. And she's done a couple others, too. So she's got something a book called The Right Three and The Calder Game. Again, highly recommend this author. So that could be one that you check into also. And then the last fiction book I'd like to highlight um, is a series, and so some of the kids might have read this, Frank Einstein, and this one is, and the Antimator Motor, but again, it's a series, so if you want to look for them, they're by John Sheshka, and so any of you that know kids' poetry, he writes a lot of great, funny poems, too, so you would like that. And again, it's got a lot of pictures in the book. It's an easier read, so it can be good for kids of all ages, certainly fourth graders, but down farther too. A lot of pictures. And then this one, again, at the very back of it, uh, kind of tells you how you can try making some of your own things too and brings out some facts and interesting information that the kids might like after they've read it. So highly recommend the whole series, but uh, try any of them, and I think your kids will like that one too. Okay, we're going to move on to picture books now. Um, picture books, first of all, are great for all ages. I think some people think once your kids are over age six or seven, you don't read picture books to them anymore. Picture books are great for all ages, trust me. The first one I'd like to share is called Stars. I just, it's just, it's a touching, wonderful, moving book. So it talks about stars and how stars are everywhere, not just in the sky, but you can look up and find stars. You can draw a star, keep it in your pocket for when you need it. Um, it, it just, it helps you just touch base with your feelings and think about how thinking of stars can be helpful to you. And at the very end, it shows how people can gather together to go out into the night and look for stars and be together. So anyway, this to me is just a touching book that would be fun to share with kids. And then go outside and look at the stars. You know, find a nice night where you can do some stargazing. So that's one I recommend. Then I have a couple by Rebecca K. Dotlich, who, for third graders, she uh, lives right here in Indianapolis, is a well-known poet and author, and has come and worked with our third graders when they do their poetry unit. This one is called One Day, The End. And for any of you who have students that love to write, if your kids are writers and have great imaginations, 
they will love this book. When you go to one, and I'll show just the first page, it's very simple. It just says, um, one day I lost my dog, found him, the end. But you can see from looking at the pictures that the dog did a whole lot of things in between getting lost and being found. And so students could then take the, these two pages and then write a story about everything the dog got into and all of the adventures for that dog. And every page is different about that. And it just pretty much starts with one day and then ends with the end. One day I hid from my brother he found me, the end. But when the kids look at the pictures, they can see all the things that happened in between, and they can then get creative and write a story about it. So for those who love to write, this might be a good book to get, um, get them jump-started on some great stories. The Knowing Book is one of those, um, kind of like Dr. Seuss's Oh, The Places You'll Go. It makes adults cry <laughs> and kids uh, just enjoy the story. So I would go ahead and suggest uh, this one. It just um, talks to kids about what they can do in the world. Um, it talks about opening a door, following a trail, and before you forget, look up. So it's just telling all the kids what to do to make sure that they do the important things in life. And it's just a moving, touching story. Again, by Rebecca K. Dotlich. Um, highly recommend it. You'll love it. It will be one of those that you'll want to read to your child when they graduate from high school, when they graduate from college, when they go off and get married. It's a great book. The next one I want to talk about is called The Rough Patch. This one is sad. I'll let you know that right off the bat. Um, it's about um, the death of a dog, a pet dog. But, but that has happened to some of our students, and I will hear about that, you know, as years go on. So if you ever um, have that happen or just want to maybe prepare kids, this is about Evan who loses his pet dog, and he has a really um, hard time with it. And he ends up tearing up his garden um, he and his dog used to spend a lot of time out in the garden and he loved it and he tore it up, he carries it all away, he doesn't want to have anything to do with it anymore and then some of the itchy weeds start coming back, he still tries to ignore it, finally he tries to make it kind of be deep and dark like he's feeling right then but then something starts to grow and he decides to leave it there and as it grows it becomes a pumpkin and then as the pumpkin continues to mature it's a huge pumpkin and this fair week comes by and that's something he always enjoyed and went to so he decides he'll take his pumpkin to the fair and he actually wins first prize and he finds out that first prize is either ten dollars or the pick of a litter of puppies and at first he's only going to take the money that's all he wants but then he decides to look into the puppy box and then when he leaves you see he's got a new he's got a new puppy friend with him so again it's a great book to share whether or not you've experienced the loss of a pet kids will really appreciate the the lesson and and the story so i recommend the rough patch and the last fiction book I want to talk about is the, a new one by Patricia Polacco. I love her. Um, I've read Patricia Polacco books to kids at school. This one's called Sticks and Stones. She always writes a lot of her, and she's also the illustrator of her picture books. She pulls from her own life, so you hear a lot about Patricia Polacco and her childhood. And this one is a good one, too, because it talks about when she is uh, in a new school in Michigan, she has two friends and the three of them together are often sort of picked on and teased by other students. And it talks about how they navigate those waters and how they get through it and they stay friends together. But again, lots of good lessons in there for all kids. And her illustrations are amazing. I'll just show you one page like, um, here's a picture 
when one of her friends was getting teased by but her illustrations just have um, if you see her illustrations you know it's Patricia Polacco so I recommend all of her books but this is her newest one and it's a really good one to talk about and there are the three friends that are trying to help each other out as they navigate some rough times and kids have to navigate rough times sometimes so I recommend that one and then the last set of books that I've got listed are poetry books and there are two that I'm going to talk about. The first one is called Peaceful Pieces and um, every poem in here has to do with peace which is again an important topic for kids to think about and hear and learn and discuss. One of the things that I love about this, Anna Gro Grossnickel Hines, the author, she's the illustrator, but her illustrations are actually pictures of quilts that she has made. So, for example, the first one, you can see that her illustrations are quilts that she has created and used to match the poems. And every page is like that. So this one is just so cool because of that. And at the end, at the back of the book, it talks about um, uh, not only how she creates the illustrations, but she also has a section on some of the peacemakers that she talks about and, and has focused on. So you can read a little bit of bios of those and then read about how she creates her quilts. So a very cool book and the poems are really great. So I recommend that one. And then the other one I'll share with you is called The Poetry of Us, but it's really poems all about the U.S. So every page is either a poem about a place in the United States, a celebration that takes place for people in the United States. For example, there's some on Independence Day. A lot of the illustrations are photographs. So all combined together, it's amazing. It's just chock full of poetry that has to do with places and times of the United States. And it'll show you, like, as you go through the book, it's talking about places in the Great Plains or the Midwest or wherever the case may be. So again, if your child is a poetry lover and they want some poems that celebrate people, places, and um, celebrations in, in the U.S., I would highly recommend this book. So those are some that I wanted to highlight. Again, good luck there. If you look through my list, it's way longer than that. I apologize. I can never limit it uh, to the number I'm supposed to. But thank you for sharing some time with me. I hope you find some great books and uh, Good luck with all of that and have a great holiday season. Thanks. I am Katie Baker, the co-interim head of middle school. In true distance learning fashion, I thought I'd deliver my parent education series book recommendations via a Zoom recording. I'm going to move pretty quickly through my slideshow because I have a lot to share. It was really hard to narrow down this list. A few asterisks to go along with my list. The list of books that I'm sharing today has been crowdsourced. I asked the language arts teachers for recommendations and asked students the question, it is your friend's birthday and his or her parents wanted to gift your friend a book, so they've asked you for advice. What would you recommend? I got some great responses. Some of my favorites are also in this list. This list is not balanced in genre and the scales tip heavily towards dystopian and fantasy books, which is not surprising since those are super popular genres right now. I've not read many of these books. Please make sure to check out Common Sense or another site that will give age recommendations and book themes to make sure the content matches what you feel appropriate for your child. This book list has been sent to Mrs. Goller and Mrs. Westerman to make sure that we have copies of these books in our library and that the this list is added to the Sycamore Library website. I'll start with noteworthy books, I'll move into bingeable series, and then end with authors to watch. Lastly, I love to read and I read a lot of young adult books. If you haven't given a young adult book a try, I highly recommend them. They are quick reads but are great stories. I encourage you to pick out one of these suggested books to read from yourself. I hope you enjoy the list. Have a great day. An Anthology of Intriguing Animals by Ben Hoor. Readers will discover incredible facts and fascinating stories about their favorite animals and some they have never heard of. Each animal is revealed in stunning photos and gorgeous illustrations. 
Calling All Minds by Temple Grandin. Calling All Minds delves into the science behind inventions, the steps various people took to create and improve upon ideas as they evolved, and the ways in which young inventors can continue to think about and understand what it means to tinker, to fiddle, and to innovate. The Thrifty Guide to the American Revolution, a Handbook for Time Travelers by Jonathan Stokes. From the publishers of the Who Was books comes a great series to make history approachable, engaging, and funny. The Thrifty Guide to the American Revolution provides useful information for the practical time traveler, like, where can I find a decent hotel room in Colonial New England? Are major credit cards accepted? The Season of Sticks Malone by Kekla Magoon. This is a kooky adventure tale about two small town Indiana brothers, Caleb, who is 10, and Bobby Jean, who is 11, who come under the influence of a cool but shady 16-year-old neighbor with big secrets. The Inquisitor's Tale, or The Three Magical Children and Their Holy Dog by Adam Gidwitz. It's 1242. On a dark night, travelers from across France cross paths at an inn and begin to tell stories of three children. As the narrator collects their tales, the story of these three unlikely allies becomes together. Their adventures take them on a chase through France to escape prejudice and persecution and to save precious and holy texts from being burned. They're taken captive by knights, sit alongside a king, and save the land from a farting dragon. And as their quest drives them forward to a final showdown at Mont St. Michael, all will come to question if these children can perform the mirac miracles of saints. Playing Atari with Saddam Hussein by Jennifer Roy. At the start of 1991, 11-year-old Ali was consumed by his love for soccer, video games, and American television shows. Then on January 17th, Iraq's dictator Saddam Hussein went to war. Over the next 43 days, Ali and his family survived bombings, food shortages, and constant fear. Ali and his brothers played soccer on the abandoned streets of their Basra neighborhood, wondering when or if their medic father would return from the war front. This is the story of one ordinary kid's view of life during war. Hello Universe by Aaron and Trotta Kelly. In one day, four lives weave together in unexpected ways. The four aren't friends, at least not until one pulls a prank that traps another and his pet guinea pig at the bottom of a well. Through luck, smarts, bravery, and a little help from the universe, a rescue is performed, a bully is put in his place, and friendship blooms. Wolf Hollow by Lauren Wolk. Annabelle is live, has lived a mostly quiet, steady life in her small Pennsylvania town until the day new student Betty walks into her class. Betty quickly reveals herself to be a cruel and manipulative, and while her bullying seems isolated at first, things quickly escalate, and reclusive World War I veteran Toby becomes the target of her attacks. While others have always seen Toby's strangeness, Annabelle knows only kindness. She will soon need to find the courage to stand as a lone voice of justice as tensions mount. The Night Diary by Vera Nani. It's 1947 in India, newly independent of British rule, has been separated into two countries, Pakistan and India. The divide has created much tension between Hindus and Muslims and hundreds of thousands are killed crossing borders. Half Muslim, half Hindu 12 year old Nisha doesn't know where she belongs or what her country is anymore. When Papa decides it's too dangerous to stay in what is now Pakistan, Nisha and her family become refugees and embark first by train but later on foot to reach her new home. Pulled through Nisha's letters to her mother, the Night Diary is a heartfelt story of one girl's search for home, for her own identity, and for a hopeful future. The Book of Boy by Katherine Gilbert Murdoch. A young outcast, Boy, is swept up into an action-packed and suspenseful, suspenseful medieval expedition across Europe to gather seven precious relics of St. Peter. Boy quickly realizes this journey is not an innocent one. They are stealing the relics and accumulating dangerous enemies in the process. But Boy is determined to see his pilgrimage through until the end. For what if St. Peter has the power to make him the same as the other boys? Harbor Me by Jacqueline Woodson. It all starts when six kids have to meet for a weekly chat by themselves with no adults to listen in. There, in the room they soon dub the art room, short for a room to talk, A-R-T-T. -T. They discover it's safe to talk about what's bothering them. 
everything from Esteban's father deportation and Haley's father incarceration to Amari's feels, fears of ra racial profiling and Ashton's adjustment to his changing family fortunes. When the six are together, they can express the feelings and fears they have to hide from the rest of the world. And together, they can grow braver and more ready for the rest of their lives. The War That Saved My Life by Kimberly Brubaker Bradley. 10-year-old Ada has never left her one-room apartment. Her mother is too humili humiliated by Ada's twisted foot to let her outside. So when her brother Jamie is shipped off to London to escape the war, Ada doesn't waste a minute. She sneaks out to join him. So begins a new adventure for Ada and for Susan Smith, the woman who was forced to take the two kids in. As Ada teaches herself to ride a pony, learns to read and watches for German spies, she begins to trust Susan and Susan begins to love Ada and Jamie. But in the end, will their bond be enough to hold them together through wartime? Tangerine by Edward Bloor. Paul Fisher sees the world from behind glasses so thick he looks like a bug-eyed alien, but he's not so blind that he can't see there are some very unusual things about his family's new home in Tangerine County, Florida. Where else does a sinkhole swallow the school, fire burn underground for years, and lightning strike at the same time every day? The chaos is compounded by constant harassment from his football star brother, and adjusting to life in Tangerine isn't easy for Paul until he joins the soccer team at his middle school. With the help of his new teammates, Paul begins to discover what lies beneath the surface of a strange new hometown. And he also gains the courage to face up to some secrets his family has been keeping from him for far too long. In Tangerine, it seems anything is possible. Before I Fall by Lauren Oliver. For popular high school senior Samantha Kingston, February 12th, Cupid Day should be one big party, a day of Valentine's and roses at and the privileges that come with being at the top of the social pyramid. And it is, until she dies in a terrible accident that night. However, she still wakes up the next morning. In fact, Sam lives the last day of her life seven times until she realizes that by making even the slightest changes, she may hold more power than she ever imagined. Before I Fall is now a major motion picture. Gregor the Overlander by Suzanne Collins. When Gregor falls through the a grate in the laundry room of his apartment building he hurls into the dark underland where spiders, rats, cockroaches coexist uneasily with humans. This world is on the brink of war and Gregor's arrival is no accident. A prophecy foretells that Gregor has a role to play in the underland's uncertain future. Gregor wants no part of it until he realizes it's the only way to solve the mystery of his father's disappearance. Reluctantly, Gregor embarks on a dangerous adventure that will change both him and the Underland forever. This is book one in the Underland Chronicles. Now on to bingeable series. Of course, Rick Riordan is on this list. Rick Riordan got many, many recommendations from our uh, students. The two biggest ones were Percy Jackson series and Heroes of Olympus. Both are um, about mythology. Percy Jackson is about the sea god, the son of the sea god Poseidon and his other demigod friends as they go on a series of quests that will have them facing monsters, gods, and conniving figures from Greek mythology. Heroes of Olympus, excuse me, Heroes of Olympus, is told from multiple points of view. Percy Jackson's adventures continue and escalate as he teams up with Greek and Roman demigods to stop Gaia, the earth mother, from destroying the world. Combining Greek and Roman mythology with modern day character, characters kids will relate to and root for. Artemis Fowl series by Owen Colfer. 12 year old Artemis is a millionaire, a genius, and above all, a criminal mastermind. But Artemis doesn't know what he's taken on when he kidnaps a fairy, Captain Holly Short of the Leprechaun Unit. These aren't the fairies of the bedtime stories, they're dangerous. Land of Stories by Chris Colfer. The Land of Stories tells the tale of twins Alex and Connor. Through the mysterious powers of a cherished book of stories, they leave their world behind and find themselves in a foreign land full of wonder and magic where they come face to face with fairy tale characters they grew up reading about. But after a series of encounters with witches, wolves, goblins, and trolls alike, getting back home is going to be harder than they thought. The Crossover Series by Kwame Alexander. It is, this book is told in dynamic verse. 
With a bolt of lightning on my kicks, the court is sizzling. My sweat is drizzling. Stop all that quivering, because tonight I'm delivering, raps 12-year-old Josh Bell. Thanks to their dad, he and his twin brother Jordan are kings on the court. But Josh has more than basketball in his blood. He's got mad beats, too, which help him find his rhythm when it's all on the line. As their winning season unfolds, things begin to change. When Jordan meets a girl, the twins' bond unravels. Keeper of the Lost City series by Shannon Messenger. 12-year-old Sophie Foster has a secret. She's a telepath, someone who could read minds. It's a talent she's never known how to explain. Everything changes the day she meets Fitz, a mysterious and adorable boy who appears out of nowhere and who can also read minds like her. She discovers that there's somewhere she does belong and that staying with her family will put her in grave danger. In the blink of an eye, Sophie is forced to leave behind everything and start a new life in a place that is vastly different from what she has ever known. The Unwanted series by Lisa McMahon. Kirkus Reviews calls this the Hunger Games meets Harry Potter. Every year in Quill, 13-year-olds are sorted into categories. The strong, intelligent wanteds go to university, and the artistic unwanteds are sent to their deaths. Alex is announced as an unwanted, and his twin Aaron, a wanted. Upon arrival to the death farm, there is instead a place called Our Time, which each child is taught to cultivate their creative abilities and learn how to use them magically but it's a rare, unique occurrence for twins to be separated between wanted and unwanted. And as Alex and Aaron's bond stretches across their separation, a threat arises for the survival of our time that will pit brothers against brother in an ultimate magical battle. Of course, Hunger Games and Divergent is on here. These have been um, around for several years and they are both motion pictures as well, but our middle school kids are still reading them a lot and showed up many times on our book recommendations. The Delirium series by Lauren Oliver. In an alternate United States, love has been declared a dangerous disease and the government forces everyone who reaches 18 to have a procedure called the cure, which is brain surgery. But with 95 days left until her treatment, Lena meets an enigmatic Alex, a boy from the wild who lives under the government's radar. What will happen if they do the unthinkable and fall in love? The Legend series by Marie Lu. Set in a dark, futuristic Los Angeles, the Western United States has become home to the Warring Republic. A young government prodigy, June, and the infamous Most Wanted Criminal Day cross paths in this thrilling romantic young adult series. The School for Good and Evil by Soman Ch Chainani. This year, best friends Sophie and Agatha are about to discover where all the lost children go, the fabled school for good and evil, where ordinary boys and girls are trained to be fairy tale heroes and villains. But when the two girls are swept into the endless woods, they find their fortunes reversed. Sophie's dumped in this, into the school for evil to take uglification, death curses, and henchman training, while Agatha finds, her, Agatha finds herself in the school for good thrust amongst handsome princes and fair maidens for classes in princess etiquette and animal communication. But what if the mistake is actually the first clue to discovering who Sophie and Agatha really are? The Mortal Instruments series. The first book in this series is City of Bones and this is by Cassandra Clare. When 15 year old Clary Frey heads out to the Pandemonium Club in New York City, she hardly expects to witness a murder much less a murder committed by three teenagers covered with strange tattoos and brandishing bizarre weapons. Then the boy disappears into thin air. This is Clary's first meeting with the Shadow Hunters, warriors dedicated to ridding the earth of demons. When her mother disappears and Clary herself is attacked by a demon, but why would demons be interested in ordinary mundanes like Clay, Clary and her mother? The Selection Series by Kira Cass. For 35 girls, the selection is the chance of a lifetime, the opportunity to escape a rigid caste system, live in a palace, and compete for the heart of gorgeous Prince Maxton. But for America Singer, being selected is a nightmare. It means turning her back on her secret love with Aspen, who is a caste below her, and competing for a crown she doesn't want. Then America meets Prince Maxon and realizes that the life she always dreamed of may not compare to the figure, the future she never imagined. Authors to watch. The first is Jason Reynolds. The byline on his website is, 
Here's what I plan to do, not write boring books. Jason Reynolds is an author of novels and poetry for young adult and middle grade audiences, including the track series. The first book in the series, Ghost, is won multiple awards and is one of his well-known books. He also wrote As Brave As You and Reynolds returned to poetry with Long Way Down. Eighth grade students are currently reading stamped and language arts classes. Brandon Mull is the author best known for his children's fantasy series, Fable Haven, as well as the Beyonders trilogy and the Five Kingdoms series. Marissa Mayer's debut book was Cinder from the Luna Chronicles. The Luna Chronicles are about uh, where the characters play off different fairy tales and it's a mix of fantasy and science fiction. Um, she is also known for the Renegade series and her newest book, Instant Karma. Ruta, Ruta is one of my most favorite authors. Ruta Sepetis, uh, um, her website byline is The Seeker of Lost Stories. Her stories are historical fiction and they are amazing. I was gonna recommend her books anyways, but then several students also recommended them. Fountains of Silence, I recommend to anyone that will listen. It is such an amazing story. And last but not least, we can't, not include John Green and J.K. Rowling in, list, in a list of who will be on our watch list for authors. Our kids are still loving and reading Harry Potter, and I got many, many recommendations from students by John Green. John Green is one of my other favorite authors, and some of his older books I really, really enjoy. I hope some of these books have piqued your interest. Happy reading! Thank you.